Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Oil Well Sarco Fourth Quarter 2019 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press star and zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Mr. Blake McCarthy, Vice President of Corporate Development and Investor Relations. Sir, you may begin. Welcome, everyone, to National Oil Well Varco's fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. With me today are Clay Williams, our Chairman, President, and CEO, and Jose Bayardo, our Senior Vice President and CFO. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that some of today's comments are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal security laws. They involve risks and uncertainties, and and actual results may differ materially. No one should assume these forward-looking statements remain valid later in the quarter or later in the year. For a more detailed discussion of the major risk factors affecting our business, please refer to the latest Forms 10-K and 10-Q filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Our comments also include non-GAAP measures. Reconciliations to the nearest corresponding GAAP measures are in our earnings release, available on our website. On a U.S. GAAP basis for the fourth quarter of 2019, NOV reported revenues of $2.28 billion and a net loss of $385 million, or $1.01 per share. Our use of the term EBITDA throughout this morning's call corresponds with the term adjusted EBITDA, as defined in our earnings release. Later in the call, we will host a question and answer session. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up to permit more participation. Now, let me turn the call over to Clay. Thank you, Blake. NOV's results continued to improve sequentially during the fourth quarter of 2019 as revenue increased 7% from the third quarter and EBITDA increased to $288 million, or 12.6% of revenue. Despite continued deterioration of the North American market, all three of our segments increased EBITDA sequentially. On a year-over-year basis, NOV was able to post an increase in EBITDA during the fourth quarter of 2019 despite revenue being down more than $100 million from the fourth quarter of 2018. Aggressive cost reductions and facility downsizing contributed significantly to the NOV's improving financial performance, and Jose and I will speak more to this in just a moment. Revenues for the full year 2019 were $8.48 billion, a 0.3% improvement from the prior year. Full-year EBITDA of $885 million declined 3% from the prior year. 2019 was a pivotal year for the energy industry. We entered 2019 with commodity and equity markets signaling strongly to market participants that growth for growth's sake, without commensurate returns to capital providers, would no longer be tolerated. Sources of all forms of capital to the industry, public equity, private equity, bank debt, public debt, became scarce and expensive, as evidenced, for example, by the collapse in trading multiples of oil field public equities in early 2019. At the time, we interpreted this as the evaporation of a widely held narrative, gauzy conventional wisdom that a commodity price spike would someday soon lead us back to a more prosperous oil field and save us all. Through the first four years of the downturn, 2015 to 2018, this narrative was responsible, we think, for a significant structural option value component in equities and asset values in the oil field. This makes sense to me because the oil and gas industry has a 160-year history of extreme volatility and sophisticated investors recognize the corresponding option value that goes with this volatility. As the leading provider of capital-intensive capital equipment to oilfield service companies, we tend to watch such trends. Our customers frequently rely on external capital to buy the equipment that we provide them. And by the beginning of 2019, providers of external capital to oil and gas producers and service companies were exhausted, tired of waiting patiently for a recovery that felt like it continued to slip over the horizon. So they choked back on the capital that they were previously pumping into the operations of our customers. Now, capital is to oil and gas what oxygen is to the rest of us. Petroleum is arguably the most capital-intensive undertaking of all industrial enterprises, and oil field services is probably second. Operators react quickly when you choke off their air supply. They pulled back hard on CapEx budgets, particularly in the U.S., unconventional plays, resulting in a peak-to-trough decline of 27% in the U.S. land rig count over the course of the year, while international and offshore projects with favorable return characteristics continued to receive FID green lights. The industry as a whole, particularly the U.S., finally seemed to be resigning itself to the fact that commodity price spike is not going to save the day, and the old way of doing business is not going to cut it. It will, unfortunately, be lower for longer, and that is the new conventional wisdom that emerged at the beginning of 2019. 
I wanted to step through this perspective with you this morning because I believe it has important implications for our company and our industry over the next few years, and this perspective has guided our strategic decisions through 2019. First, with respect to the elusive recovery, through this year of capital austerity, some might say capital starvation, I've been struck by the number of conversations I have had with other oil patch old timers where we agree that this lack of capital is as bad as any time we saw during the 1980s or 1990s. Therein lie the seeds of a return to prosperity, because the new grim view that has taken hold is now driving the industry to reduce its structural overcapacity, taking actions that will return this industry to health. Asset retirements, facility closures, regional withdrawals, exits from businesses, and consolidations got underway in earnest in 2019. While individually none of these will heal the space, collectively they inevitably lead the industry to better discipline, pricing, and shareholder returns. NOV share the task began materially back in 2015 when we started reducing our overcapacity, facilities footprint, and SG&A, but our efforts were accelerated sharply beginning in 2019 as the reality of the new market normal became apparent. Our team has undertaken many difficult decisions, including pulling back from unprofitable markets and closing numerous facilities around the world, some of which uh, have been NOV mainstays for decades. Since 2015, we have closed 483 facilities to shrink our own internal capacity to better fit market demand. We've adopted a more efficient shared services model in many regions, and through the hard work of our team through this past year, we've established a clear and tangible path to at least $230 million in annual cost savings as compared to the first quarter of 2019. Thus far, we have obtained approximately $170 million in annualized savings, up about $82 million sequentially in the fourth quarter. And we continue to evaluate every opportunity to increase that number. Second, every product line, no matter how well established, has fallen under the microscope of an in-depth returns analysis. Those that do not currently meet our internal threshold have either developed a tangible plan for near-term improvement or have been slotted for divestiture or closure. Ultimately, 2019 was a year about building and solidifying our staying power. Operationally, we're leaner, more efficient, and more agile to react to the shifts in the market. Third, from a balance sheet perspective, we continue to increase the strength of our capital structure in order to maintain the flexibility to act opportunistically. During the fourth quarter, we called $1 billion in debt due in 2022, repaying a portion with cash and a portion with longer tenor notes in a new issue that is due 2029. Fourth, we tailored our strategy to fit a world where oil field services customers have limited access to capital. Commercially, NOV won much of this race during the period from 2006 to 2014 when we won a significant portion of the largest build-out of oil field service equipment the industry has seen in a generation. We delivered 379 offshore new build uh, drilling packages since 2006, for instance. So today, we benefit from having the largest installed base of oil field equipment in the world. This enormous installed base gives rise to new, attractive business opportunities that are unique to NOV. Aftermarket spares and services support, software system enhancements, the application of big data-driven predictive analytics products to drive efficiencies, the evolution of mechanization to automation of processes in the oil field, for instance. We are creating differentiated digital offerings built on over three decades of gathering big data in the oil field through our MD Totco products and eHawk service offerings, among others. Due to our installed base of equipment that touches nearly every well site in the world, we're uniquely positioned as perhaps the only common thread between hundreds of unique equipment suppliers with thousands of non-standardized sensor tags. On new product development, with capital scarce and oil field equipment oversupplied, it makes less sense for oil field service contractors to spend millions of dollars on new units. Rather, we see the next attractive opportunities as being smaller dollar investments that our customers can make and bigger impact enhancements that will enable them to differentiate their equipment in a crowded marketplace. While there will be certain large new build project opportunities that arise, even in this tough market, we will remain disciplined and will choose not to follow our competitors in doing the stupid stuff that desperate competitors inevitably do. A strong balance sheet and a large install base of equipment requiring ongoing OEM support is the best way to ride out an industry downturn. The good news for NOV is that we have both. New product development has zeroed in on bolt-on products that carry a price tag our customers can afford with value-added efficiency or useful life-improving profile that they can justify to their shareholders. Think in terms of track ID tags for drill pipe monitoring and auto tallies on rigs, 
Novos operating system enhancements that our customers can charge their oil company customers for. New directional drilling tools like Select Shift, which have no similar peer in the marketplace. Power blade energy management systems, which reduce diesel consumption and carbon footprint for offshore drillers. Affordable products, which can be used to retrofit existing capacity to improve its attractiveness in the marketplace. Lastly, with respect to our outlook for the year, we're prepared to endure continued levels of reduced activity in North America, with a meaningful market recovery unlikely to take hold before 2021, the kind of market that suits affordable, fit-for-market solutions. International activity continues to be a bright spot as we enter 2020 for NOV, as customers in the Middle East and other regions around the world look to harness the technologies that enable the U.S. unconventional revolution, where our rig technology segment is experiencing limited demand for new equipment in North America, we're scheduled to deliver multiple new rigs and rig upgrade packages this year to the Middle East as several countries in the region seek to upgrade their fleets. We are pleased with our progress on our Saudi joint venture and expect to begin delivering the first of 50 modern, highly efficient super spec rigs to the kingdom in 2021. Offshore drilling and production continues to grow at a measured pace. Our Wellstream processing business an industry leader in production processing technologies, including monoethylene glycol regeneration units, is tendering at twice the pace that it was at this time last year, indicative of greater activity in the offshore. As the world continues to learn more about the coronavirus outbreak, we're hopeful, first, that authorities around the globe are able to ease the suffering that is causing so many. We also hope that its impact on the world's economy broadly, and the oil and gas industry specifically, is short-lived, but we're realistic in acknowledging that globalization leaves us exposed to market uncertainty as it does for other industries. We expect that our scale and global footprint will help us mitigate any direct supply chain repercussions, but the situation nevertheless remains fluid in early 2020. Finally, before I hand it over to Jose, I'd like to finish where I began. If I've learned anything from business, it's to be skeptical, skeptical of conventional wisdom because collectively we are all, well, frequently wrong. I would be surprised to see a robust global recovery emerge in the oil field in 2020 or even 2021, so we are managing the business accordingly. However, I do think a recovery will emerge when no one is predicting it. The only facts I know for certain is that the oil industry has seen global growth in demand for almost every single one of its 160 years and that the industry has always been highly cyclical. The current time feels an awful lot like the 1990s when then, as now, capital providers to oil and gas were fatigued and frustrated. Another period of capital starvation. And then, as now, the industry responded by trimming over capacity. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, and I'm encouraged that, the, that here in the sixth year of the downturn, the oil and gas industry is serious about reducing its structural oversupply. There is a parallel narrative embedded in conventional wisdom about a looming energy transition, one that fully displaces fossil fuels and therefore one that likely further diminishes the option value of oil field assets, at least in the minds of some investors. While I'm confident mankind will transition to better forms of energy in the future, the shape and pace of that transi transition are probably going to surprise us all. In the near term, oil and gas remain critical fuels that play a key role in, for instance, air travel and feeding the planet. So they will be part of the energy mix for many years, perhaps generations to come. Nevertheless, an energy transition is emerging as, potentially, the most valuable and interesting business opportunity of the 21st century. So there is one more small but important element to our strategy, which is figuring out how NOV can capitalize on this and how we can make money by facilitating it. We quietly launched this initiative a few years ago to play offense rather than defense against this emerging backdrop. We're not spending much money in this area, but I have been very encouraged by what our teams are developing, and I hope to be able to share more with you on future calls about the opportunities emerging for NOV in this space. To our employees listening around the world, Thank you for all that you do. Your resiliency, your, your dedication, your hard work made a tough year a great year for NOV, and Jose and I could not be more thankful to have you on our team. With that, I'll turn it over to Jose. Thank you, Clay. NOV's consolidated revenues increased $155 million to $2.28 billion, or 7% sequentially, as the continued momentum in international and offshore markets helped drive a 15% sequential improvement in international revenues, more than offsetting the impact of a rapid decline in North American activity levels during the fourth quarter. EBITDA increased $26 million sequentially to $288 million, driven by strong operational performance and continued progress on cost savings initiatives, partially offset by favorable project closeout variances from Q3 not repeating and a less favorable product sales mix in our completion and production solutions and rig technology segments. 
As Clay mentioned, we continue to make progress on efforts to right-size our business and improve efficiencies across the organization and expect to realize another $24 million in annualized cost savings in the first quarter, or a $6 million improvement in Q1 over Q4. We've also been reducing the working capital intensity of our business. We converted $246 million of working capital to cash in the fourth quarter and generated $473 million in cash flow from operations. After deducting $67 million of capital expenditures, free cash flow for the quarter was $406 million, bringing our second half 2019 free cash flow to $689 million, significantly exceeding our target. Despite our expectation that capital expenditures for NOV will increase to around $325 million in 2020 as we ramp spending on our new rig manufacturing facility in Saudi Arabia, we believe we will increase free cash flow by at least $100 million year over year and that working capital will be a source of cash for NOV in 2020. During the fourth quarter, we took measures to further strengthen our balance sheet by redeeming a billion dollars of senior notes due December 2022 and issuing $500 million of new senior unsecured notes due 2029. These transactions extended the maturity of $500 million of existing debt by seven years and reduced our debt by approximately $500 million, leaving us with $1.989 billion in gross debt as of December 31st. Cash flow generated in Q4 allowed us to reduce net debt to $818 million at year end. Our actions demonstrate what we've long said, that defending the balance sheet is our top capital allocation priority. Our actions are designed to ensure NOV can successfully manage tumultuous market conditions and provide the flexibility to be opportunistic with compelling high return investments that we may identify. As you know, NOV has a share buyback authorization that is contingent on the company achieving gross debt to annualized EBITDA of less than two times. If 2020 continues to unfold as we expect, we will likely begin stock buybacks later in the year. A few housekeeping items before we dive into our segment level results. During the fourth quarter, we took $537 million in mostly non-cash impairment and other charges due to the further deterioration in North American market conditions and our ongoing restructuring efforts. Lower intercompany sales from cross-segment projects resulted in a $3 million sequential decrease in revenue eliminations. In the first quarter of 2020, we expect intercompany sales to remain in line with the fourth quarter of 2019. Other expenses increased $44 million sequentially and included $26 million in expenses associated with the retirement of a $1 billion of our 2022 notes and a $14 million increase in foreign exchange losses. And finally, while our effective tax rate may continue to be volatile over the near future, we expect our tax rate will average approximately 35% for 2020. Moving to results from operations. Our wellbore technology segment generated $764 million in revenue in the fourth quarter, a decrease of $29 million, or 4% sequentially. Revenues from North America declined 13%, slightly more than the fall-off in drilling activity, while revenues from the segment's international operations increased 7%. Despite the decline in revenue, EBITDA for the segment increased by $10 million sequentially to $143 million, primarily due to the successful implementation of cost savings initiatives and structural improvements to operational efficiency across the business units in this segment. Our Reed Heike Log drill bit business posted a less than 1% decline in revenue due to continued weakness in the North American market that was mostly offset by growth in most international markets and continued market share gains in the U.S., or high-performing bits are allowing us to gain share and preserve pricing in a competitive market. Revenues in our downhole business unit fell 12% as reduced demand and increased pricing pressures in North America were partially offset by higher revenues in most Eastern Hemisphere markets. Despite the challenges in the North American market, we continue to see healthy demand for our leading-edge motor, elastomer, and other technologies, including our select-shift adjustable motors, which are enabling customers to complete single-run wells with greater consistency and reliability. During the fourth quarter, we helped a customer in the Morcellus Basin drill a record-setting 19,132-foot single-run well. Our MD Todco business unit realized a slight increase in revenue as the contribution from our growing number of drilling automation projects in the Norwegian North Sea more than offset a decline in revenue for MD Todco's business in North America. Our Tubascope business unit saw revenues fall 5% sequentially. 
Revenue from the business unit's coding operations were down slightly, and inspection service revenues fell 6% as lower drilling activity levels in the U.S. and holidays reduced output from mills and outside processors. Revenues in our well site services business unit declined 12% sequentially on fewer U.S. fluids jobs, but the unit's core solids control business only experienced a 5% sequential decrease in revenues. Its U.S. operations performed in line with the 11% fall off in drilling activity, but was partially offset by growing opportunities in international and offshore markets. We're encouraged to have begun working on several projects in the Gulf of Mexico recently, in addition to seeing rising demand overseas. Our Grant Pride Co. drill pipe business realized a sharp increase in revenues in the fourth quarter as we shipped large volumes of high-spec drill pipe for international markets. Additionally, as was the case in the third quarter, more than 50% of the business unit's revenues were derived from offshore products. While orders for drill pipe in the U.S. have been sparse over the past few quarters, customers' drill pipe inventories that we hold in the U.S. are at the lowest levels in recent history. We believe any material increase in drilling activity will require a healthy increase in orders. Meanwhile, as international customers restock diminished inventories, we continue to see rising demand for our Delta drill pipe connection technology. Looking to Q1 for the wellbore technology segment, the coronavirus, oil prices, seasonality, and evolving E&P budgeting practices all remain wild cards. But at this time, we expect revenues for our wellbore technology segment will decline between 6 to 12% with decremental margins in the mid-30% range. Our completion and production solutions segment generated $799 million in revenue in the fourth quarter, an increase of $71 million or, or 10% sequentially. Growing demand from offshore and international markets was partially offset by lower demand for completion equipment in U.S. land markets. EBITDA increased $14 million sequentially to $96 million or 12% of sales. Incremental margins were limited to 20% as modestly higher sequential cost savings were offset by favorable credits related to the closeout of projects in Q3 that did not repeat in the fourth quarter. Segment began realizing a considerable increase in orders during late 2018, largely driven by offshore and international projects. This trend continued through the fourth quarter, resulting in orders of $502 million in its fifth straight quarter with a book to bill in excess of 100%. While the project pipeline remains robust for 2020, at this point we expect lower orders in the first quarter due to the timing of specific projects. Our fiberglass systems business unit posted an 8% sequential improvement in revenues, achieving the highest levels of revenue in its history. Increased deliveries of spoolable pipe from our new manufacturing plant in Dimam, Saudi Arabia, and marine scrubber system components needed to retrofit vessels for IMO 2020 compliance drove the sequential growth but was partially offset by rapidly contracting demand in North America, where orders decreased 15% sequentially. We expect the need for additional scrubber systems to remain robust, with experts estimating that owners of shipping vessels can achieve paybacks on their investments in less than a year, based on current price spreads between low sulfur and traditional bunker fuel. Our intervention and stimulation equipment business realized a 3% sequential increase in revenue on strong year-end shipments of coil tubing and wireline units. However, margins decreased roughly 100 basis points on a less favorable product mix as revenues from pressure pumping aftermarket parts and services declined to a level that is less than half its recent highs. Results from this business unit remain depressed due to the structural overcapacity of of the North American completions market. However, the business continues to advance its technological leadership by assisting our customers in finding new, less capital-intensive ways to improve profitability for themselves and their end customers. Our FracMax, Big Bore Quick Latch, and Frac Hose products are examples that are lower-cost solutions for improving operational efficiencies and safety in a cash-constrained environment. Business is also focused on pursuing opportunities in other markets, such as the Middle East, Latin America, and China, where the development of tight and unconventional natural gas formations is driving equipment needs that mirror what is used in North America. In the fourth quarter, we booked and delivered a large package of high-pressure equipment to an operator in northwestern China, where there has been a rapid increase in the amount of hydraulic fracturing activities and is therefore experiencing a corresponding increase in demand for high-pressure flow line equipment in the Changqing and Xinjiang gas fields. Our process and flow technologies business unit realized revenue growth in each of the unit's major product lines. 
The unit's production midstream product offering saw a sequential decrease in demand in North America that was more than offset by large shipments of pump packages to India and an uptick in sales of production chokes, including the first batch of chokes built in our new manufacturing facility in Dammam, Saudi Arabia. Business Unit also realized its third straight quarter of improved results from its offshore market-focused Wellstream processing and APL turret mooring product offerings, primarily driven by growing LNG-related activity. Headlining the order book was a monoethylene glycol regeneration and reclamation unit for an LNG project in Mozambique and an order for our newly developed electrostatic coalescer technology, EPAC, that will be installed at the Equinor Johann Sverdrup. Tendering activity for the offshore market remains the strongest in recent memory, which is reflected in the business's ability to post a book-to-bill in excess of 150% and which should begin to allow for incremental pricing improvements during the year. Our subsea flexible pipe business posted a 15% sequential increase in revenues, but at low flow through as the market for flexible pipe remains very price competitive. Bookings improved from the third quarter, generating a book to bill of 134% and included more than 56 miles of flexible pipeline systems for a project in the North Sea. Our team continues to use its technology advantages to focus on higher value add projects. For the first quarter of 2020, we expect revenues from our completion and production solutions segment to decline 10 to 15 percent sequentially, with decremental EBITDA margins in the upper 20 to lower 30 percent range. Our rig technology segment generated 759 million in revenue in the fourth quarter, an increase of 110 million. A sharp increase in land rig equipment sales, including sales of older inventory at low margins and improved progress on offshore projects, drove the 17 percent sequential improvement in revenue. However, an unfavorable shift in product mix together with old inventory we've moved at a discount were only partially offset by cost savings, which limited incremental margins and resulted in a $7 million increase in EBITDA to $112 million or 14.8% of sales. Orders declined $10 million or 5% to $211 million in the fourth quarter, and total segment backlog at year-end was $2.99 billion. Sharp improvement in land revenues resulted from a significant increase in year-end equipment deliveries and better progress on land rig projects. During the fourth quarter, we booked orders for six land rigs destined for multiple customers in the Middle East, with three of the rig orders specifying our Novos control system. We are seeing NOCs more frequently pushing their contractors to provide high-spec land drilling rigs that can meaningfully improve performance and operator returns. The growing number of international operators pursuing development of tight gas formations is accelerating the demand for this equipment. And similar to what we are seeing in our intervention and stimulation equipment business unit, the equipment these customers are seeking is beginning to look like the high-spec equipment found in West Texas. We've seen this in Argentina for several years and are now seeing customers across the Middle East and Asia pursue 1,500 horsepower rig packages with three gen sets that are almost identical to what we are selling into the U.S. During the fourth quarter, we also realized a substantial increase in revenues from deliveries of offshore capital equipment and from improved progress on our offshore wind construction vessel projects. We continue to see gradual improvement in offshore markets with steady demand for rig equipment and technology upgrades, as well as a growing opportunity set for our marine construction business, including replacement cranes for FPSOs, equipment for pipe lay vessels, and additional offshore wind construction vessels. NOV continues to leverage our core competencies to assist in the development of solutions that help our customers reduce their environmental footprint while also improving operational efficiencies. In the fourth quarter, we introduced our PowerBlade hybrid system that is currently being installed on a rig in the Norwegian continental shelf. PowerBlade allows drilling contractors to reduce their carbon footprint and fuel costs by recycling the captured energy back into the rig. We estimate that the power blade system will allow the drilling contractor to reduce diesel consumptions by 771,000 gallons per year, saving them $1.75 million in cash, reducing 110 tons of NOx emissions per year and reducing reducing their carbon footprint or CO2 emissions by 6,200 tons per year. Revenues from our rig aftermarket operations were flat sequentially due to a decrease in spare part sales that resulted from budget exhaustion that set in with our customers near the end of the year. Additionally, the significant increase in the number of rigs enrolled in our total cost of ownership programs moderates the Q4 uplift we've historically seen in our service and repair operations. We've increased the number of offshore rigs in our programs to 83 at year end, an increase of over 2.4 times since the end of 2018. 
In the first quarter of 2020, we expect lower deliveries of capital equipment to be partially offset by a slight increase in aftermarket sales, resulting in a 10 to 15 percent sequential decrease in revenues and a 100 to 300 basis point reduction in EBITDA margins. While we know there is much more work to be done in 2020, we were pleased with the strong finish to 2019 and the progress the organization made on key initiatives throughout the year. Actions taken by the talented, hardworking employees of NOV allowed us to balance our efforts to reduce costs and improve operational efficiencies with advancing our technologies and supporting our customers with cost-effective solutions. Those actions have NOV well-positioned for the future. With that, we'll now open the call to questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Brian Pope with Tudor Pickering Halting Company. Your line is now open. Morning, guys. Morning, Byron. Byron. It's like recognizing the, the extra uncertainty injected into the, the market by the recent pullback in Brent prices, could you just frame for us at a high level how you think about the international uh, growth drivers among the three business segments, again, just at a high level? Yeah, we're, um, you know, big picture um, uh, North America, we expect to, uh, I think like everyone else, to uh, endure uh, a slowdown, continued slowdown in activity, and we're preparing for that. But we're more, much more encouraged overseas and in uh, offshore markets in particular. So um, that continues to, to move higher, and what we're hearing from our customers is that, um, that they're moving forward with uh, a lot of projects that they've been working on, reducing costs and engineering in over the last um, several years, and so, um, uh, you know, excited about that for 2020. And then uh, the Middle East um, has, has continued to remain very active, and as you're well aware, we've increased our our um, presence uh, in, in uh, those markets and are encouraged by uh, the needs that uh, that our customers uh, have there for equipment and technologies that NOV provides. So generally, you know, North America uh, drifting down and uh, uh, offshore and international moving up, um, uh, current oil price volatility notwithstanding, Byron. Thanks. And then my second question, just again in qualitative terms, could you, Clay, could you think back on the, the five incremental NOV growth drivers, growth opportunities that you guys laid out back at the 2018 Analyst Day, just from your perspective, how things are progressing, again, notwithstanding the near-term North America headwinds, but just how those have played out relative to your expectations? Well, the main, the main thing I'm most proud of is our continued investment in technologies and products through the downturn, and we certainly highlighted that uh, in our analyst day, which was, um, uh, you know, well over a year ago, and, and in a very different sort of commodity price, price environment. But, you know, I look back on the progress we've made um, really since the downturn started, um, I think NOV has probably introduced more new products and new technologies than any of our peers out there. We, we launched our uh, Navisota test rig um, at the very end of 2014, and that's been responsible for dozens of products and technologies. Um, we've come out with um, very impactful digital solutions through this time period. Um, predictive analytics uh, for BOPs, for example, our Novos operating system, our GoConnect um, uh, uh, digital products, things like that, and so um, I think I think we've you know balanced the cost cutting and the retrenchment that has been necessary with continuing to invest in the long term future of the company and and, and the technologies that are going to make that that happen. And so I'm I'm very proud of our organization in terms of progress uh, on these things. And I I think uh, you know in a lot of ways through the downturn um, we've been focused on uh, in addition to efficiencies and getting better at working capital management on really laying the foundation for what the next up cycle looks like. Thanks, Clay. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tommy Mall with Steven Zink. Your line is now open. Good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Morning, Tommy. So I wanted to, to touch on the uh, portfolio review that you've been undertaking for some time now. Um, it, it's clear it's a returns-driven analysis that you're running through. And so my question is, as you're evaluating what to keep and what to prune, how many years forward are you willing to look for a, a, 
a, a business line or a unit to hit the kind of returns that you'd like to see to keep it in the portfolio. And, and the reason I'm asking is clearly offshore and international have some momentum, but we, we need to play that forward for some reasonable yeah. time horizon to get comfortable to, to where you're willing to underwrite. So anything you could do to help us frame that up would be helpful. Yeah, it's a, that's a that's a great question. I'm gonna let Blake chime in here in a minute because he's heading up this effort. But I would I would say um, it depends on the potential to achieve what we always aim at in the application of capital, which is a defensible uh, business that has uh, demonstrable competitive advantage over the long haul is the ultimate goal. And so when we look at these different businesses and kind of the current state of affairs and the current state of their markets and so forth, we take a view necessarily on what's the likelihood and probability that we'll get to that state, that, that defensible competitive advantage in a, you know, reasonable period of time. And so I would say our patience level is uh, somewhat dependent upon the potential payoff and attractiveness of that particular um, uh, business uh, opportunity, but it's really kind of opportunity by by opportunity that that we uh, that we evaluate this. Yeah, Tommy, uh, I think we touched on this last quarter, but you know this is not just a quantitative exercise, but also a qualitative. And so you know we 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 take a step back and say like, oh, you know, if this business you know is below the return threshold, but it's been you know bouncing along the bottom of of the down cycle, and we can see a clear tangible path to hey. The orders have completely pivoted on this one and done a full 180. We're not going to sell it at the bottom of its earnings potential. Um, now, I will say, you know, Clay touches upon our patience level. For a lot of these that did fall below the threshold, we were able to implement some discrete action plans that are in the process right now that we will reevaluate. And most of these action plans only take about three to nine months. So just more self-help, which is, you know, part of our job is managing these businesses. Uh, and those that we find are to be unfixable, uh, those will be evaluated for divestiture or just a pure exit. Yeah, that's our that's our first inclination is around, uh, you know, we're paid to fix these things and run these things, and so are there steps we can take uh, first? So that's probably what we're, where our default is um, for, for businesses that fall below the thresholds initially. Very helpful. Thank, thank you both. And as a follow-up, I wanted to double back on the international and offshore outlook. Uh, again, looks like um, we'll be up for 2020 versus the prior year just in terms of the addressable market there. Are there any particular uh, aspects where you think NOV could maybe outperform the broader market business lines or, or parts of the world where you're most excited that you would call out for us? Yeah, probably probably what we're – we're certainly well known for – um, drilling equipment, offshore rigs, all the all things drilling. What's probably less well known by investors on Wall Street is the fact that we've sort of quietly assembled a really interesting portfolio of products that are more focused on production, going into um, uh, FPSOs, fixed platforms, um, uh, processes around production in terms of sand separation, oil water separation, uh, mono, monoethylene glycol regeneration units, um, things like that. And so I'm really, really uh, proud of that portfolio, and I think there's really interesting opportunities uh, uh, that are going to continue to emerge um, in the offshore um, where, where NOV is likely to play maybe a little larger role than we would have in a prior upturn. Thank you. That's all for me, and I'll turn it back. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Our next question comes from Chase Mulville with Bank of America. Your line is now open. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, so I, I guess, you know, Clay, you talked a, a bit about kind of energy transition um, and so I'm just kind of curious if, if you can kind of flush it out a little bit more here and, and kind of talk about, you know, your strategy uh, at, towards energy transition and, and you, know, you know, maybe organically what you're doing and then also maybe on the M&A side. Yeah. Um, first, I'd say that uh, we have a presence in this space going back many years and, in fact, many decades with respect to geothermal, for instance, where you probably – uh, be hard pressed to find a geothermal well that doesn't have NOV technology involved with on, with it uh, anywhere in the globe. And then secondly, uh, I think last year we had a couple of um, announcements around uh, offshore wind installation vessels, which is a space that NOV has a 
has a very uh, – has a market-leading position in terms of the technologies in vessels that install offshore wind turbines. And, um, and so we've been in renewables um, uh, uh, for, you know, going back a long, a long time. My comments in the prepared remarks, though, really are just to, um, to let you know that we're thinking about other ways to participate in this and viewing it as potentially a, a terrific business opportunity. You know, when I think about energy, energy really is all about infrastructure, about capital deployment. Historically, uh, pivoting from one form of energy uh, to another is sort of a decades-long process, but involves enormous amounts of capital, involves uh, project execution, and involves application of technology, it involves creative ideas. Um, uh, you know, NOV you know, has a lot of those uh, in abundance, and so uh, I do think there's a role here that we can play in, uh, in helping make that happen. But the, what I want to stress is um, we're aiming at, at capital returns coming out of that, at um, the opportunity to develop technologies and, and um, services and methods that help in that transition, but but also uh, earn excellent returns for our shareholders. And so that's how I'm framing this. I don't have a lot more to add to that other than uh, what I said earlier, some ideas in this space that we think are unique that potentially can turn into really interesting and profitable businesses. And, uh, but we, I generally don't, um, uh, won't get into the details until we're, we're you know, earning, making revenue with these things. Okay, all right, thanks, Clay. Um, I guess if, if we kind of come to the supply chain a little bit and think about the coronavirus, you know, you mentioned it a little bit. Um, you know, there's there's obviously a direct impact and maybe maybe some direct impact, indirect impacts um, as we think about the supply chain being so interconnected. Um, is there a certain you know segment that we should look at um, and and try to understand better about uh, the impact from kind of what's going on over in China? Um, and then, you know, help us understand, you know, what, how much of that is actually in your guide um, there, Blake. Hey, Jason. So, Jose, I'll, I'll, I'll field this and, and, and Clay can chime in. But, um, no, it is, it is a situation that is evolving rapidly, and it's something that we're monitoring very closely. So, you know, our, our, I think our biggest exposure to this is more from a supply chain standpoint than it is from uh, a customer uh, revenue opportunity set. But as we did talk about in some of the prepared remarks, um, you know, China is an emerging and growing uh, market for our end products in which we're having uh, more and more success uh, with our differentiated technology offerings. Um, we do have a very global and diversified uh, supply chain, but, you know, as we sit here today and we're looking at, you know, the ex an extended shutdown uh, of the uh, Chinese, China New Year holiday system, um, you know, that is, that, that is impacting our ability to uh, produce certain products to a certain degree. At this point, we still have a lot of latitude to make up lost ground. Uh, but if this were to extend uh, much longer, uh, there are areas, for instance, within our fiberglass business where uh, we have limitations in terms of the amount of uh, resin uh, that's on the ground at our manufacturing plants uh, right now. So there's some, some risk there, but so far, uh, so good. Uh, similar type of exposure related to drill pipe manufacturing, um, uh, other businesses to a lesser extent. But so far, uh, we think our team is managing through it uh, pretty effectively, uh, uh, but still a lot of uncertainty uh, related to the extent to which this will impact operations. Yeah, yeah, and those are sort of first order impacts, I'm equally concerned about second order impacts, which is the impact that this has on global demand for oil, the, what it's done in the commodity price markets, and, and more to the point, kind of what it does to the psychology of oil and gas producers as they think about how much to drill uh, in, in 2020. So it's, it's, as we said, the situation remains very fluid. Yep, understood. All righty, I'll turn it back over. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Scott Gruber with Citigroup. Your line is now open. Yes, good morning. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. Um, turning to C&P, how should we think about the C&P margin profile over the, the course of 2020? I'm just thinking about uh, the interplay between you know, the mix shift uh, in the revenue stream towards more international and offshore, but also the cost out program. Um, I know you don't want to provide uh, too many specifics beyond one quarter out, but just any general color on how that margin profile should progress uh, given that interplay? 
Yeah, Scott, it's, it, it, it's Jose, and I'll, I'll start off on this one. So, you know, we're not going to really deviate from the typical way we describe in terms of thinking about uh, margin uh, progression for the cap segment, which is really think of it in terms of incremental uh, margins, uh, basically dollar dropping between $0.25 cents to $0.35 cents down to uh, the EBITDA line, and obviously that is dependent uh, on the mix of the business, and really what you're getting at is, you know, with the, you know, decline that we're seeing in uh, demand for equipment in the North American market and, you know, the solid growth that we're seeing uh, overseas, particularly for offshore uh, markets, um, typically some of those offshore projects, um, you know, in the early phases of recovery uh, have been uh, slightly more challenged from a margin perspective. But as Clay alluded to, and I think we touched on a couple times during our uh, uh, prepared remarks, uh, with the amount of tendering activity, we think we're starting to now see more opportunities for pricing uh, improvements. But here, as, you know, we stand today, uh, you also need to think about the latency time associated with some of these offshore projects where they sort of reside and are backlog a, a bit longer than the shorter cycle uh, North American-centric uh, product offering. So, you know, what's going through uh, and converting to revenue right now is a, a, to a large degree stuff that was booked 9, 12 months ago. And so as we start uh, capturing better uh, pricing, uh, we should see uh, the incremental margin profile improve along with, uh, you know, being further supported by the cost-cutting initiative efforts that we have underway. Yeah, just, but overall, you know, for the year, do you think um, that we should be thinking about kind of lighter than normal margins or, or given some of the pricing trends, can you end up doing closer to the normal incremental for the year? I think on a blended basis, yeah. it's, it's more. It's, 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 There's a lot of puts yeah, and takes here. A lot of parts and pieces, so I would assume uh, fairly normal. Okay, um, and then maybe if you just um, give us a quick update on the uh, the rental um, initiative that, that you guys uh, really pushed forward uh, a couple years ago, um, you know, particularly on the, the drilling tool side of the business, but uh, even more broadly, just an update on the uh, the rental model uh, initiative, you know, particularly as the uh, international markets uh, pick up further in 2020. You're, Scott, you're talking about our, our uh, drilling tools business. Um, relate, the rental, We have a couple of rental businesses around NOV, but I think you're talking about the investment we've made in directional drilling technologies, rotary steerables, uh, and select shift. And we we'll tell you that uh, we're continuing to gain traction uh, in that. We've got um, uh, uh, three different uh, rotary steerable uh, uh, tools in the marketplace, including what we think is the lowest cost uh, a diff very highly differentiated rotary steerable tool. Um, our select shift motor that we um, uh, introduced uh, um, last year, uh, which is the adjustable bent housing motor that could be adjusted down hole. Uh, a very large operator in the U.S. is testing that this week. We've had a lot of excitement around that. Um, MWD tools also that we have in the in the space. So we're we're continuing to make progress in here. But that that strategy was built on the recognition that unconventional drilling, uh, unconventional shales really rely on uh, geo steering, on horizontal drilling, and um, uh, it is a kind of a enabling and key technology for unconventional technologies uh, or unconventional shales, and that NOV. Uh, has an opportunity here to to be a, a, a larger provider of technology in that space. And maybe one thing I'd just add, just so there's no no, no confusion about it. Um, so as, as Clay mentioned, there's there's a number of areas where we do uh, provide rentals of equipment. You know, the space that we're talking about is a combination of both rentals and sales. We just want to make it clear yeah. that we're somewhat agnostic on that. But mm -hmm. what we do want to make clear is that this is not a service that we are providing. We are enabling uh, those directional drilling uh, service companies out there. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Appreciate the color. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kurt Hallid with RBC Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hi, Kurt. Kurt. Hey, Clay, thanks for that historical perspective. Uh, resonates with me, that's for sure. Um, so in the, in the context of, of what you guys see going forward, and, and Clay, yes, NOV has always been at the forefront of evolving on the technology front and creating some value propositions. Uh, 
that ultimately oil companies and uh, and service companies, you know, uh, find useful. Uh, you threw out that teaser about some things that you're working on, you know, in 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 the hopper. Um, you know, can you maybe elaborate a little bit? Maybe uh, give us a little bit more of a teaser as to what kind of value propositions you may be looking at, um, you know, uh, for the next leg of growth for NOV. I'm on on renewables. I'm going to demur on that. On the uh, uh, are you talking about renewables? Are you talking about tr- tr- traditional oil field, Kurt? Well, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I'll go wherever you want to take it, Clay. So if you want to demur on renewables, that's <laughs> well, fine. Well, as a matter but, of policy, uh, we like to, we much prefer to talk about things that are in the marketplace that are you know starting to get get traction. And so, in terms of what I'm most um, excited about, really, uh, uh, the predictive analytics products that we introduced uh, a few years ago continue to gain traction. I think Jose referenced the growing number of, of rigs in our programs. Um, we're monitoring equipment and and uh, able to to um, uh, predict in advance, uh, you know, operational challenges before those happen. The Novos operating system for drilling rigs, both land and offshore, is uh, gaining a lot of traction um, and, and really beginning to contribute meaningfully. Uh, our wired drill pipe, uh, IntelliServe, um, data transmission, downhole data transmission uh, technology combined with machine learning and, intelli- and artificial intelligence is improving uh, uh, results for operators. In fact, there's a, a, a great uh, article in this month's uh, Journal of Petroleum Technology about what we've done for a for a U.S. driller in that space. And so, I, I, I again, just to reiter- reiterate, could not be more proud of uh, of sort of the enhancements that uh, that we have going on. And those are actually just a few of many many things that uh, that inter- NOV has introduced through the through the downturn. Got it. And then um, just to follow up in, in the context, I appreciate that color, by the way. In the context of the capital allocation, you indicated that, um, you know, if, if all goes well, you could be you know, potentially in a position to uh, kind of restart a share repo program. Just kind of curious as to, you know, the decision framework between the, say, the share repo versus maybe, you know, uh, bump, bumping the dividend a, a, a bit. Any Any insights would be appreciated on that front. Well, thank you. Yeah, with uh, with respect to where our stock's been trading, um, you know, we we think there's good value in that, and have gone through that in, in a great deal of detail with our board. We'll continue to look at it, by the way. But we're uh, I think what, the way we view that right now is that uh, share repur- repurchase is is preferred. Um, um, but uh, uh, the key thing is that our capital priorities remain unchanged. And all of our you look back at 2019, all of our actions were really geared towards. Uh, continue to improve. Uh, we we uh, implemented a lot of cost savings that are driving better EBITDA. Um, we refinanced and uh, paid down a lot of our debt, and uh, and so we're continuing to work towards uh, being in uh, achieving the credit metrics that we talked about uh, that will pave the way for a greater level of capital return to shareholders. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sean Meekin with J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Sean. Sean. So maybe I'll, I'll try to ask the prior question just with a different angle. So in terms of the free cash guide for 2020 and uses of that cash, so we noted buybacks could be coming later this year. Obviously, dividends well covered. Uh, CapEx may be a bit elevated this year, but that's discreet, you know, uh, very specific. Um, you've also, in effect, supplemented some of your CapEx spend with technology bolt-ons over time. That's been a big part of the strategy this cycle in particular. Is something like two hundred million dollars a good run rate for for bolt ons? Just I'm trying to capture other uses of cash that could come before the buybacks in twenty. Yeah, and that's a great point, Sean. We're always looking at um uh opportunities uh uh in the M and A space and I think have been pretty transparent about that. And so what I'd say is in 2019, and this sort of fits with my prepared comments around the, the uh, uh, fact that oil field assets and equities have gotten a lot cheaper uh, in the current environment. And so um, uh, we're always looking at, at uh, kind of what's the uh, next best application of NOV's shareholders' capitals, and, and, to the, and, and that the M&A outlook uh, changes from time to time, um, you know, as, as we kind of, kind of work through the year. Yeah, Sean, it's Blake here. I'd just like to add that, you know, we, both Clay and, and our board, gives us the, you know, the, the 
flexibility. Like we don't have a run rate on like a target for acquisitions per per year. Every every acquisition is an individual investment decision uh, that we phrase that we also compare relative to the investment in our own stock. So at this point, like. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. It's a very crowded field of sellers right now and a very limited set of buyers. Uh, so that we think that there could be some attractive valuations out there, but we're going to be very, very patient. Got it. Yeah, thank you for that. That's, that's helpful feedback. Um, and then, so, you know, well done to see all the efforts on working capital start to come through and convert to cash. And that's been, you know, a, a top priority, especially for Jose. So with the 4Q result and, your expectation that working capital will be a source of cash again in 20. Uh, just curious if you have any updated thoughts on seasonality as we go through the year in terms of working capital, and then just how you're targeting working capital efficiency by the end of 2020 or 21. Maybe you know, any any uh, updated thoughts around working capital sales or uh, DSOs, inventory turns, DPOs, et cetera. Yeah, I don't think we'll get super granular in terms of specifying the the targets, but what, what I would like to spend just a moment talking about is that what we are seeing is a lot of good progress and a lot of good momentum by a lot of hardworking people uh, across the organization. We've been at it a while, uh, but obviously the results really started to come through in the second half of 2019, and we have a lot more work to do, but with the momentum that we have and opportunities that we've identified, uh, we're confident uh, in our ability to harvest more cash from our working capital and just become a lot more capital efficient as we progress uh, through 2020. So we finished uh, 2019 uh, with that working capital to revenue run rate, uh, just a tiny bit over uh, 30%. Uh, which was a good outcome for us. Um, now, uh, what we're really going to be focused on during 2020, you, know, you asked the question related to seasonality, uh, it, it, it's really going to be more focused on uh, kind of the average level of working capital intensity uh, really throughout the life of the organization. And so a lot of progress through the course of the year, but uh, you know, if you look at the average for 2019, you know, average the starting balance sheet and the ending balance sheet, apply the total annual revenue to it, uh, that was 37%. So we're trending in the right direction, but we certainly want that average to come uh, way down during the course of 2020, and that would put us at a Q4 run rate that will be uh, better than where we finish this year. Fair enough. That's really helpful. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Our next question comes from Vebs Vaishnav with Scotia Bank. Your line is now open. Hi, Vebs. Hey, good morning and a very good quarter. Uh, I guess just a clarification. You guys talked about 230 million of cost savings. Is I guess I just want to confirm that that's comparable to the 200 million dollar number earlier that yes. you guys guided to. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we found uh, another $30 million in annualized. Both those numbers are annualized um, cost savings as compared to our structure in the first quarter of 2019. Got it. Okay. Uh, CNP orders, you talked about it could be somewhat lower in 1Q. Can you just talk about what what kind of visibility do you have beyond that? And that's both for CNP orders and the RICTEC orders. Can we can we sustain what we saw buying the first Q? Can we su- sustain what we saw in 2019? Well, you know, Q4 was our I think our fifth quarter in a row of book to bill north of one for completion and production solutions. A lot a lot of these orders, uh, particularly for offshore projects, we have a lot of lead time into because there's a lot of work that goes into them. Sometimes there's feed studies behind them, things like that, and so. Um, a lot of the kind of near term, uh, the downturn that we expect in Q1 in orders and, and completion of production solutions is really just the timing of how those things fall. And um, um, but that notwithstanding, what I'm most encouraged about is the fact that our our tendering activity across the uh, portions of completion and production solutions that are focused on the offshore uh, remains very strong. Um, I think we mentioned that uh, our PFT group. Uh, for instance, uh, the pipeline there is twice what it was a year ago. And so it feels to us like uh, the offshore uh, infrastructure is continue, continuing to move forward, and that's a, that's a really good backdrop, I think, to move into 2020 with respect to orders for completion and production solutions. Great. And maybe just one last question for me, uh, and 
on the guidance for Wellbore. So it sounds, it seems like, yes, you guys did like only down, down revenue is 4% versus guidance of 5 to 7. So like not very different from the guidance. You talked about North America only declined 11%. So nothing right. spectacular in 4Q. I was a little surprised by the guidance of down 6 to 12% for 1Q. I think like you talked about China and could have yeah. impact. Could you just elaborate like what is, what guiding that in like and how should we think about North America versus international in their guidance? Yeah, part of the part of the overachievement in Q4 was uh, a higher drill pipe sales than we had expected going into the quarter, and part of our expectation for Q1 is that that turns around. That's that's a little lumpier than some of the other businesses within Wellbore um, Technologies. Yeah, and, that's, and also add, you know, you look at the you know the guidance across the board related to uh, the sequential decline from Q4 to Q1. Um, you know, we do, uh, you know, look back the last couple of years in terms of the fall off that we've had from Q4 to Q1. Feels like that the E&P budgeting process, both within North America and the international markets, is getting a little bit more prolonged and gets certainly gets amplified when you add in uh, a pullback in commodity prices uh, and the, the fears related to uh, the coronavirus. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is uh, uh, cer certainly uh, factored in to, to, an, to an extent into the, into the Q1 guide. Yeah, and one more thing. Our, our like, Reed Hycalog business, for instance, has seasonality exposure in, in Russia and uh, uh, the Rockies and places like that. So there's, it's just, uh, um, uh, you know, our expectation is that, that will, those will all contribute to Wellboard Technologies moving down in Q1. Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you for taking my call. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Clay Williams for any further remarks. I want to thank everyone for joining today, and in particular, I want to take the opportunity once again to thank any employees that might be listening, uh, frankly, uh, to thank you for the great job that you're doing. So have a, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.